Welcome or welcome back to Watch Advice on YouTube. It's Alexander speaking, your host, and with me is Geoffroy Ardern. Welcome, Geoffroy. Thank you, thank you. We are both in London, and believe it or not, we are going to show you watches that are exposed here at the Oak Collection. And I, I, Geoffroy, I don't think I say too much if I say these are watches you normally never see. Yeah, this is definitely a one-of-a-kind experience for all watch lovers around the world. Uh, we have here assembled a one-of-a-kind collection uh, where you will discover some treasures, mostly by Patek Philippe, some Rolex as well. And, uh, well, it's a pleasure to have you today with us. The owner of the collection is a French entrepreneur. He's called Patrick Gitraid. Yeah. And I think everything started when he once bought a Cartier tank. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> for a French person to buy a Cartier tank is uh, almost logical. But what is interesting is the exhibition takes place at the Design Museum. And if there is one design within the century of wristwatches, it is the design of the Cartier tank, which was born in 1918, uh, made by Louis Cartier, who got the inspiration from the tank of the First World War. And this watch, which is exhibited in the first uh, showcase of the exhibition, is interesting because this watch was uh, the first one the collector bought after winning uh, at the uh, horse racing in Paris at Longchamp. So uh, we have put the watch and we also have put the picture of the collector at the time when it first began. Because mm. a collection always begins with one watch. Now first, I start without knowing, because there are some people who start collecting at 25, 30, but they know about the watch. I didn't know nothing. I just bought some watch and, uh, that I liked, Cartier, Je Gère Le Coudre. I had 43 cars. And the thing is, the emotion that I have with the watch, nothing to do in the car or in the painting. That's why after I focus for the watch, because that's, that's my, my best, my bigger emotion. I love it. The art of collecting is selecting. Uh, we have made here a curated selection of one-of-a-kind timepieces. In total, 163 watches, but we are not going to show you all of them. This would take too long. Geoffroy and me have been choosing some of them, and you will see watches, believe it or not, you will never ever see again, probably, because they are in a private collection, and they are one of a kind. And I think we shall start with some Calatravas of Patek yeah. Philippe. The um, Calatrava is interesting in terms of design, because this is the first time Patek Philippe gave a reference to a wristwatch. And in terms of design, we have probably um, the best Calatrava in the world here exhibited in the museum. So we Let's will go. show you. Let's go and see them. Don't forget to subscribe and to hit the bell to get our latest notifications. Unfortunately, due to security reasons, uh, you can understand the watches will stay uh, within uh, the showcase. And here you have some of the best examples of Calatrava ever made by Patek Philippe. These two here, in stainless steel with black dial, one of them is the reference 530A, A means acier in French for steel, are probably the rarest of all Calatrava you can find today uh, on the market. What is interesting is with Patek Philippe, even if the watch is simple, you always have this kind of magic in the dial. You see here, you have on both of these watches uh, what we call the dial with Breguet numerals. So you would ask yourself, why do we use the name Breguet? Uh, because it's a Patek. In fact, it is Abraham Louis Breguet, the famous watchmaker, who invented this type of design. And every time there is a watch with these Arabic uh, numerals, with a very stylish numeral, we call it Breguet numerals. So yes, these two pieces uh, are, of course, of museum quality. It's almost impossible to find these watches. But what is interesting is the collector likes vintage watches 
but he also likes modern watches. And if you look at the showcase from the top part, you will see the two vintage pieces, the 570R, which is pink gold, the 570J, which is yellow gold, the original version, and as he is the VIP customer from Patek Philippe, he had the exact same watch made especially for him under the reference 5196. So this is interesting also within the Oak collection. You not only have vintage watches, you have also modern watches. And it's the combination of the two that really makes the essence of this exhibition. I don't collect only vintage, I collect also new watch. Like this one, it's a 5236 from Patek, just went out, yes. QP, platinum, goes uh, in the underwater, and, 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 and I love it. I, 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 trois guichets, three guichets. Sometimes you can feel that the person is a true person, somebody who really loves watches. I will place him just, uh, just after the Graves and Parker as uh, collectors. One question, how could anyone persuade Patrick Gitreide, the owner of the collection, to exhibit these watches? Was it his will? Was it his wish to do it? Everything that's happening today is because of him. Okay. What one needs to understand that the vision a collector has is always a vision that it is in his mind. And from the beginning, he said, I want to exhibit, I want to share my collection. Mm -hmm. Then the process was, how do we select the watches? How do we organize an exhibition? Mm -hmm. I think this is really, um, this is really um, the one-of-a-kind concept. How can you bring people to an exhibition for the first time in the history of watch collecting? An art museum, which is the design museum here in London, is exhibiting watches. Um, I have to say, this is something where uh, we both um, joined together. Mm -hmm. um, I'm originally from a family of auctioneers uh, in Paris. And um, when I started in the watch business 25 years ago, I mean, as you know, the watch business was quite small. Mm. I was dreamed myself to have one day watches in a museum. And in fact, the dream has come true. And I think this is why I would be so grateful to Mr. Jetred for having this dream and sharing this passion because, you know, when you collect watches or uh, you collect uh, other items, and especially watches, it's all about passion. Why do you like watches? Why do you like Patek Philippe? And if there is one complication that Patek Philippe lovers like is the art of the chronograph. Here we have a wide variety of chronographs, starting with the reference 130, which was the first reference used on a chronograph in the, in the 1930s. Uh, as you can see, the shape is interesting because it um, continues the shape of the famous first Galatrava, which was the reference 96. Uh, then it was adapted to a chronograph. And what is more uh, interesting is especially the readability of the dial. Here you have black dials, two-tone, Breguet numerals, pink on pink, and all of these dials have a lot of information, but for the collector, it's easy to read. It's easy to read. For instance, here we have the uh, reference 130 in steel or the one in pink gold uh, with the famous sector dial. Uh, the sector dial represents the essence of Art Deco in watchmaking. And when you see this dial, you know that this is a dial which was made in the 1930s. One needs to understand that wristwatches became very popular in the early 30s. Uh, in 1933, it's the first time wristwatches for Swiss exports were higher than pocket watches. And then we had a shift from people wearing pocket watches to people wearing wristwatches. And obviously, the years before the war have shown some incredible craftsmanship at Patek Philippe. We have such a variety of uh, chronographs. I mean, if you look at all these uh, pieces, some of them are only uh, two or three examples, others one of a kind. 
it's a collector's dream come true because not only you have the variety, but also you have uh, the quality and the rarity. And these are the two criteria which are the essence of the old collection, quality and rarity. Quality and rarity is definitely the most important criteria by which the collector has built this collection and by which we have built this exhibition together to make a selection which is for the first time presented to the public here in London. Patek was also or is still very known for making watches for traveling. Yeah. And we have an own showcase with, let's say, also very rare and very spectacular travel pieces. You're right, Alexander. I mean, if we need to talk about the ultimate watch for travelers and probably the ultimate complication for uh, Patek Philippe, it is the world time. Just a little bit of history. The world time was invented by a famous watchmaker in Geneva called Louis Gautier in the 1920s. And he developed a patent uh, which allowed the reading of time within the different cities of the world on both 12 hours and 24 hours. If we look at the watches here in the showcase, you will see the famous references 2523 and 2523 slash one, which are both of them what we call the double crown world time. These watches are definitely the most sought after wristwatches that one can find today uh, on the market. It is by essence a watch which delivers a lot of information, but again, is easy to use. You have in the center the um, 12 hour indication, then you have a revolving disc which is on 24 hour. And then you have the indications of uh, the main cities around the world where you can read instantly um, the different time zones. So if you're traveling. And not only you have the wristwatch, but you have also the pocket watch. So one example here in the center, which has probably uh, all that one could dream of is the world time system plus the cloisonné enamel dial. And this is really completely exquisite. And again, what is interesting here in this showcase is that you can see that the collector um, who started to build this collection mostly on vintage pieces started also to buy modern pieces. And you see, this is really what makes the essence of Patek. The essence of Patek is that people buy still modern watches which are within the same tradition. And this is the tradition that people like, and especially collectors. They love uh, having um, watches which are the continuity of the ones which were made 60 years ago. Geoffroy, in such an exhibition, of course, you also display some pocket watches, but not some pocket watches, but I would say some of the most sought after and uh, collectible pocket watches coming from an American collector called Henry Graves. He is remembered as the one who ordered the uh, famous super complication. He had a quest of going beyond boundaries and exploring the wide diversity of mechanism made by Patek Philippe. In this showcase, we have two pocket watches with chronometer type uh, movements. These uh, movements are definitely the highest quality you can find. One of them has won the third prize uh, in Geneva uh, Observatory. It is interesting to see that with Patek Philippe especially and with pocket watches especially, nothing is on the dial, everything is on the inside. So here yeah, within the exhibition, we are trying to uh, bring the collector and the admirer or the first time watch lover into a um, journey where he will learn what makes the essence of Patek, what makes Patek Philippe so special to collectors. Because the finishing here, I, I have to say, I mean, if you look at the um, presentation, if you look at the way uh, these three showcases are displayed, it's absolutely amazing. You see how the movement works. You see here there is the escapement. 
it really brings you into a world where you can enter the watch and you have a sense of, okay, now I understand what is Patek Philippe. One needs to understand that if today Switzerland is regarded as the homeland of watches, it's because behind every single watch, there is a watchmaker. And the watchmaker makes this watch lively. And especially when you look at these beauties here, I mean, for instance, we have here the um, tourbillon. So it is interesting to see, you know, at Patek Philippe, you never, never, never show the tourbillon. Tourbillon is never shown. In the entire history of Patek, never a tourbillon has been shown. And this gives you um, the sense why Patek Philippe is uh, so special in the heart of collectors. And this is also why there is such a fascination with Henry Graves. You know, he came at a moment where Patek Philippe was making the best watches. And one needs to know that uh, you know, he was a, probably one of the biggest collectors in the 20s, in the early 30s. In the early 30s, a lot of uh, things happened at Patek. In 1932, the Stern family uh, took over the, the company. Uh, they were still making uh, watches of the highest quality in the middle of the crisis. So here you have, I would say, um, the essence of watchmaking. The essence of watchmaking. Here you have two... Uh, minute repeaters with two different designs. You have an open face where the minute repeater is activated on the pendant and you have what we call the hunting case. So it's like closed with an enamel dial and again two different designs but as you can see the movements it's always brilliant. There's nothing to say. It's absolutely one of a kind. Geoffroy, thank you very much, first of all, to show us these Patek Philippe highlights. Thank we you, have, thank you, thank we've you We've moved so much. now the camera to the yeah. next showcases, and now it's about Rolex. And we will show you guys first some diving watches. Yeah. Then we will go to this showcase where we do have all the Pepsi GMTs. That's also spectacular. And last but not least, an own showcase with Daytonas. And believe me or not, Spectacular watches once again. So yeah, I think you know if we talked about Patek, we cannot not talk about Rolex. Um, it is also very interesting to see that the Rolex history started in London because the founder of Rolex, Hans Wilsdorf, first established himself in London more than a century ago. He was in fact obsessed by wristwatches. He then established himself in uh, Switzerland, and in 1926 there is an event that happened in the history of wristwatches, which is probably one of the most important, if not the most important event ever for the development of wristwatches. In 1926, uh, the German swimmer, Mercedes Gleitz, crossed the channel mm. and uh, she was wearing the famous Oyster. So the code name Oyster by Rolex is something that you see on your watch every day, but a lot of people don't know what it is. The Oyster, uh, code name means it's waterproof and it was the first time ever you had a waterproof wristwatch. Then in 1931 they developed the first patented movement um, self-winding automatic and therefore when you look at your Rolex now you will remember Oyster 1926 the waterproof wristwatch perpetual which is the old term uh, meaning perpetual, like in the 18th century, the first perpetual watches made by uh, Breguet. It is just a waterproof wristwatch with a self-winding mechanism. So here, in this showcase, we have gathered variants of what we call sports watches. So mostly we have some mariners, we have probably the most sought after among uh, some mariners, Comex. The Rolex phenomenon comes from going beyond the boundaries. How can you have a watch that goes down deep? How can you have a watch which is, in fact, a tool? A Rolex is a tool watch. And there is one thing which is very characteristic with the Rolex, and we have here some examples, is what I call the variance. So 
Since 1953, when the Samarina first was released in Basel, they have made the same model with different variants, with different cases, with different dials. And the dial makes everything. As you can see here, you have the red Samarina, but you have a variant which is, I've called it, the red tropical, because the dial and the bezel has this tropical brownish color. And I know, uh, Rolex lovers, that you love these discolorations. Some one might say, well, there is a discoloration. I don't want the watch. Yes, but with Rolex, it makes the watch. That's the, I have to say. We have shown in this showcase some variations also of the sports watch, like for instance, the Explorer 1, the Explorer 2, also called the Freccione. We also have to say that many nicknames have been given to Rolex watches. It is probably the most lively community where you have you know, all these uh, nicknames, uh, for instance, the Pepsi. And this is why we did also a showcase on the Pepsi. And there is one with that green base that I think you all know the nickname in the comment section. <laughs> in this showcase, you almost have, no, you don't almost, you all have, you have them all. Yeah. All <laughs> Pepsis ever made are in there. Yeah, yeah, I mean, most of them, I would say, you know, uh, we have tried within this showcase to show the um, extreme variety of what we call the GMT Master Pepsi. So, why is it called Pepsi? Because of the color which is used on the bezel. But there are also some variants because, you know, everyone's going to say to you, oh, you have a Pepsi, you have a Pepsi. But we have also some extremely rare variants. For instance, this Rolex from 1972 called the Blueberry with the bezel that evokes the Blueberry. There are some variants with faded blue Pepsi, for instance, the uh, reference 1675, you can see that the bezel is faded away. There is this kind of a patina. And I know that Rolex collectors love it. We also have the reference 6542. So I have to admit that I've learned that it's now called the Pussy Gallo Ray. So what is the uh, essence of the GMT Master? The essence of the GMT Master is you have the possibility of reading the time with not only a 12-hour dial, but also a 24-hour bezel. So why do you have the blue? Why do you have the red? Well, the blue is simple. It's from 18 to 6 o'clock. So it means it's night. The red means it's sunny. So again, this is the essence of Rolex. It's the tool watch. But the tool watch has become a collector's watch. Here we have one example made in 1997 one of only 50 pieces made, the famous Chuck Yeager, which was named after the US Army and General Charles Edmund Chuck Yeager, who was the first man to break the sound barrier in 1947. I love this uh, showcase. I, I don't know, I'm looking at this showcase. It's, uh, it seems like uh, so lively. Um, well, so Pepsi, you know, it's Pepsi is uh, also a word that people use when there is a situation which is Pepsi, like, you know, it's, it's Pepsi. With all this advertising for Pepsi, don't let us forget to say Coke. Ah, yes, because yes. there's one Coke too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to do some good for the other, yeah, for yeah, the other we'll, ones. We'll have to do a good balance now. <laughs> we have also the Coke. So, but it's the Coke. So you have the red, the white, and the black. So far, now we're standing in the front of a showcase uh, where watches are exposed, uh, where there is a name involved that is probably the most stressed name for wristwatches, and this name is Dayton. I would say it's, it's been probably the um, ultimate chronograph design within the uh, 20th century. So interestingly enough, the um, Rolex Daytona was launched in 1963. It was not very popular at the time. And then suddenly they um, got this exotic dial, which is now called uh, Paul Newman. And in fact, it's interesting to see that collectors again have given a nickname to 
these exotic dial that you see here with these references on the top part of this uh, showcase. And here it's interesting that you can see within the showcase uh, not only the famous Daytona Paul Newman, but you can so also see some of the variants uh, within the chronograph uh, history. For instance, you have what we call the Dato Compax uh, chronograph, so-called the Jean-Claude Killy. Jean-Claude Killy, the famous uh, French uh, skier, three times Olympic champion. Also, there is a historical watch here in the uh, center, the Palmiro Togliatti uh, wristwatch. So what, what is the historical provenance? Because I think this is, you know, we talked about quality, rarity, but there is one thing which is really important for a watch collector and for the old collection, which is provenance. And this watch is uh, interesting because this watch, in fact, was a token of gratitude given by the um, first secretary of the Communist Party in Italy to his doctor for saving his life. So uh, it is interesting, you know, that again, um, watches can be seen also as an act of uh, gratitude. And uh, I think it's really interesting to see that if I had to sum up the collection, if I had to sum up the entire um, exhibition, I would say that um, all my gratitude goes to the collector because he's the one who made this possible. You know, we just uh, uh, bring things together, we try um, as much as we can to assemble, but the, uh, the driving force, you know, the, the, um, in, in, in a watch you have the driving force. The driving force is always the collector. And I think uh, I've been in this business for many years now. Uh, I'm always amazed by the collector, always amazed. Uh, the collector sees his watches, knows his watches, loves his watches. And yes, the old collection is all about passion. Without passion, nothing exists. Most of my watches are all new stock. Yes. They must be all top. The dial, the, the boîte, the, the mechanism, it has to be untouched and new. And that, that's what's making it sometimes difficult to buy because there is not so many top, 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 top watch. We have two watch here. One is a Patek. What is special? It's one of a kind. And uh, it's fantastic and thank you, thank you, thank you. Because uh, when everybody is fighting to get a Nautilus, yes. <laughs> I had one, one of a kind. So that, that, that's, that's fun and, 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 and thank you to Patek. And this one is a Paul Newman 6239 yes. from uh, Apollo 7, Mr. Cunningham, yes. and he went on the sky. Geoffroy, first of all, thank you very much for uh, quickly you, running us you, through here. You. We have been literally picking out some of the watches, but there is a total of 163 watches being exposed here. Yeah, we have also other watches. Uh, you will be able to see some highly complicated Patek Philippe's, and some of the most exquisite perpetual calendars with chronographs. There's uh, also some Nautilus here. <laughs> there's also some Nautilus. Yes, there will be um, a wide variety of watches. We made a selection, I think, we tried uh, as much as possible to represent um, the essence of the old collection. But all of this needs to be more comprehensible by the public, because we have collectors, but we have first-time lovers and people who don't know about watches. And I think this is really the challenge with the, the exhibition, is to bring everyone together. I mean, the exhibition uh, will last until the 25th of uh, May. It's open to the public here at the Design Museum. Uh, we will wel welcome all these uh, watch lovers, if they are first-time uh, viewers or they are, uh, you know, uh, super, um, uh, acknowledgeable and they know a lot about watches and it will be a pleasure to have them because it's a pleasure to share. I think this is what makes the essence of collecting. So the exhibition is open to the public, you don't need to sign up, you don't need, you don't to, need to go to online, up. fill in yeah, yeah. some... You come it's at the and, Design and you, Museum. You come and have fun. Yeah, you come and have fun and you will, will learn. Are, you will, will learn. That's very important because I think, you know, 
even for us uh, experts. Uh, I always say that if you want to be a real expert, you need to learn, to learn. Always, you know, you cannot know everything. You need to learn. So I hope people will learn something and they will say, oh, I didn't know about this. So you are all welcome to the Oak Collection here at the Design Museum in London. So guys, just in case you missed the exhibition here in London or you're not able to make it to come to London, there's no need uh, to worry because the exhibition then moves on to the Bahrain National Museum and later on this year it will move to China and to the US. Where in China and where in the US, in the US is not yet known and will be announced soon, but the exhibition will move on and I can expect if it is a huge success that uh, the owner, the collector, will probably think about expanding to other cities as well.